Hey, let's go. Well, welcome everybody. We're uh, we're really excited to have uh, um, on the path. Um, presents out loud and we have got uh, our continuing series of women and girls in sports um, it's a national women and girls in sports um, it was a few days ago and and uh, we were we're really uh, excited to get the, the perspective of some longtime athletes and coaches uh, that are that have been around uh, today we got we've got patty hill who is uh, has been uh, an, an unbelievable athlete athlete and coach and she's done activities director stuff and uh, and she's She's with us today, uh, Diane Acevedo, who is uh, all those things as well. It was an outstanding athlete and a, and a, and a coach and, uh, and an athletic director now. And, uh, you know, and then we've got uh, Amanda Miramontes, who is uh, currently a softball coach and uh, has, uh, has some first rate experience and uh, played down in, in the uh, Orange County zone. So she's uh, got a perspective from uh, a couple different angles and we're really excited to have you guys. So welcome. I'm glad that, glad you guys came on and we're excited to, to chat and, and chop it up a little bit. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. So I think I think we'll start. We'll jump right in. What I'd like to do is maybe just get a quick uh, little bit of background on each of you, and uh, if we want to start with Patty. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Patty Hill. Uh, maiden name is Wattis. I went to uh, Dorsey High School in Los Angeles, and that was when high school was three years. So I was a three-year varsity athlete, um, kind of a late bloomer. Just really started playing ball there. Kind of watched baseball really. So softball was a little different for me. Um, and then I went on to college and played four years of college at Whittier College, or four years of softball at Whittier College. Nice. Um, after that, two years of coaching there as an assistant. And then I started at Pioneer. Um, Diane's first year was my first year. And uh, 12 years of coaching varsity wow. softball. And then I wow. handed it over to her. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good segue. Yeah. So I'm Diane Acevedo. And kind of just piggybacking on on Patty, we kind of have the same similar path. I started playing softball at the age of eight, and then I moved on and went to Pioneer High School, and again, coached under Patty, uh, played there for my all four years at the varsity level, and then um, I went to community college first, went to Rio Hondo, played softball there for two years, and then transferred to Whittier College and played another two years to finish off my four, and then right after that, got into coaching and ironically got into coaching with Patty Hill. So, you know, we made full circle and uh, I coached and I was the head coach uh, after she had stepped down for about another three years until I stepped down in 2016. And that's where we get Miss Miramontes coming through. <laughs> My name is Amanda Miramontes, maiden name is Vanderlip. Um, like you guys, I played ball since I was seven years old. Um, I actually grew up in the mean streets of West Anaheim. When I say mean streets, it actually kind of where I went to Magnolia High School. <laughs> A lot of rough around the edges and diversity that existed there. Um, I went to Cal State Fullerton straight out of high school on academic scholarship. So I, I'm one of those like wish I would have probably could have played softball at the collegiate level. My number one biggest regret um, and that often factors into kind of my love for coaching because I like to really share my story with uh, athletes that have potential, um, just assure that they don't make the same mistakes that I, I kind of made, um, that they don't live with regret. And even if you go play at the JUCO level, you know, um, oh. at least you had that experience and it could definitely open up doors. And I just look back on it and I wish... I wish I was, I took that route. I wish Patty coached me. When you hear that it's, it's women and girls, uh, national sports day. What, what do you think about? Oh, honestly, coach. Um, I had made a statement that I didn't even know that day existed up until this year, which really sucks. I played college ball and, you know, coached all these young ladies through the years. And I didn't know there was a set day. And, um, and it's really kind of surprising because it's part of my, part of my thesis project right now is, um, is actually on how transgender is going to affect Title IX in high right um, school <clears throat> sports. So I'm still working on that whole thing. I think that women's sports have has come a long way, but it's still not where you know where we want it to be. Nor, um, I mean, I get the whole professional sports and how men's uh, athletics and games bring in so much more money, and that's part of the reason why they can get all these big deals, but 
you know, there's a lot of young women athletes that are remarkable and they don't get the fame that, um, that the men do sometimes. When I think about a team, I think about who's the weakest link on the team. And it's not a judgment. I just look at a person and I know that the ball is going to find that person. You know, I put that kid in right field, the ball is going to find it, you know, put the kid wherever. It doesn't matter. Yep. And I also take that with me on into society, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, what's the, what's the upside? What, what, what do I lose as a man? What do I lose as a male coach or a male athlete for you guys to be amazing? I mean, there's nobody that's sitting closer to the TV for the Women's World Cup in soccer than me. I love that team. That's the just inspires me, even since the 99ers. You know, like, I, I just don't understand this idea of why would we squash anybody's opportunity to, and if it has, and it's just money? What do you, what do you, what do you see, Diane, in terms of, of the uh, upswing, the good stuff? Is there? Is yeah. There that- no, I, I agree. There are some good stuff. I mean, I just remember when, I started softball was like, okay, it was coming about a little bit. It opened up a little bit more. Um, And then it wasn't really until after college that, you know, they got a little bit more TV time. You started to see more college games. Um, I look at my nieces who are nine and eight and the game has just changed so much. I mean, they are so young and they're already like individual trainings, individual helmets and bats. And there's already this investment from parents and you see passionate dads out there and you see just the, the whole family comes out. And it's interesting when you're going to these parks and you're seeing this younger generation play and the little brother is sitting in the stands. Uh, as Patty was saying, it's there still could be more and we mm-hmm. can still keep moving forward. And again, it's taken us a little bit of time to get there, but there is a shift and, and you kind of start to see that in this younger generation. Have you gotten any of the fallout from, you know, things getting better as have you seen that me playing ball as an athlete to now it's just evolved so much you know growing up I softball was just an everyday norm in my life and it it didn't occur to me that there was in any inequality that even ever existed until I got older and I think Patty said it great in terms of you know examining it on a, a, a macro level if you will like we're definitely making progress. Do I think that we're on the even playing field? No, I don't. Um, do I think that we could potentially get there? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, I well, I think there's a there's a certain amount of, of everybody's perspective on it that, that really makes yeah. a difference, you know, and, and people see it differently. And, you know, it, I, I think that's a, a testament to the fact that it has come a little bit of ways that you've seen, you know, that, that, that kind of change. It didn't affect you. Now that you see that it's gotten to the point where you're starting to see what's missing, you know, Patty said an interesting thing about her thesis. I see a lot of female athletes um, play male-driven sports. So, for instance, I've seen females in wrestling. I've seen females play football. I've seen females even play baseball. And it always sparked my interest because the baseball boys, and they always, you know, I have half of them as my students. And so they're always, Moose, can we come play tryout? And I'm like, yeah, actually, yes. Like, I would take the 6'5" freaking I mean we don't have a five guy on campus but (laughs) you know what I mean like I'll take a freaking yoked out football guy that can freaking drive it or the fence all day as my number four hitter you know they can't hit the rise ball either don't worry (laughs) but if I were to do that there would be such a backlash you know what I mean due to the inequality that exists between a male and a female they won't let a guy come play baseball and they won't let a guy play softball, softball and they won't let a girl play baseball because you have your opportunity there. There's, it's just a lack of opportunity yeah, right there after, you know, I did not know that. Yeah. I just always, you know, questioned it. Like, what? well, I got to see Cheryl Miller play basketball in high school. She was better than any dude. Mm-hmm. She was better. You know, she was dunking and doing everything. I was like, you know, she's better than her brother at that time for sure. You know, better than Reggie. Yeah, and Reggie's a Hall of Famer. So what does that tell you? You know, like I know I've coached football for for thirty years, and I know that there are some female athletes that could have played ahead of some of the guys that we had to play. You know, we played wow. some guys at wide receiver that I know there were some girl athletes that could step in and play out. Yeah. Well, I think it, right. my my experience at Dominguez Hills. We had our two MVPs in those three years were both kids that played baseball their whole life. And then as puberty hit, they transitioned into softball, but they had that entire, you know, five years old to probably 12 or 13 playing baseball uh, situation. They were just, it was a different mental level, the way they moved. and, And I was actually talking to one of the girls that I coached. We had her on the pod. One of her deals was she was so trained as a softball player that she was a robot. 
Like she would not, it was, everything was boom. Here's how you, you put your hand yeah. here, you put your hand on top, you funnel it, you pull it to your arm, you know, like all this stuff. I'm like, just play. That's the one big difference. You know, I, the girl that was our MVP, she would scoop, she'd play shortstop. She would scoop the ball and throw it with her mitt, you know, like she would just spit it out. She wouldn't, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, just, I'm yeah. like, where'd you learn that? Oh, that's what we do in baseball. And it can be beneficial and it can be, it's hard to pick for sure. But I, I know that the girls that I coached that were baseball players were, were pretty darn snazzy for sure. They were just different. What's, what's your thoughts on that, Patty? Like I said, growing up, I, I didn't start playing softball really like competitive softball until I was in high school. I played all these kind of co-ed leagues at school yeah. <laughs> partially because, and, and my dad will probably hear this, but I always tell him, you know, he loved my brother more than me. Yeah. And it came to like Culver City to go play baseball, but supposedly there was no softball teams around. So I kind of learned by osmosis, right, to to play baseball and to love baseball and to see them play flip, you know, and, and to play all like pepper games and stuff. Pepper. And I I remember playing those games with Die and those first teams, and they yeah. must have thought I was a fool. Like <laughs> Pepper, you know and and flip like i'm like just have fun you gotta play flip before the game yeah. but uh, yeah. but then the girls had like the chants right and the songs and yeah. and it took me a while to get into that um you know the first time i played softball and girls were singing i was like just shut up let me let me pay attention to the game <laughs> yeah, i think with that challenge the challenges i think that that we face too is commitment i think commitment has has gotten lost a little bit in in women's sports included, because there are so many travel teams and there are so many, my playtime, my playtime, things like that, that, that growth that you're talking about, Tommy is, is a little lost because they don't know what it is to have that team unity, yeah. right? They're, they're too busy jumping from this team to that team. Like, no, there's still college. College is like our professional uh, status, right? And so we're, we're driving that into the kids. Like, go to college, play softball, do this. And it's such a small percentage, right? It's like 1% of people who play. And Amanda said it earlier too. It's such an opportunity to play at a community college level, at a D3 level, at yeah. any collegiate level. And we've lost that a little bit because we're just so like, get there, get there, get there, scholarship, 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 where playing a team sport is so much more to that. Because at the beginning of my career, they had travel ball was blacked out during the season like you couldn't practice on the weekends you couldn't do any of that stuff and then all of a sudden Correct. i was getting these girls where their arm was hanging from sunday practice and they couldn't we couldn't do a defensive drill on monday i had some girls that felt comfortable speaking to me and saying you know tom or coach this is how i'm going to get to college and you know i had to think about it a lot like what is the value of high school what i came up with was travel ball is going to get you to college but i'm going to get you to stay like that was my thing. Like I'm trying to add value to your life. You're going to understand what it's going to be like to be with 18 or 20 girls on a bus or in a hotel room or, you know, and you know what? They actually kind of went, Oh, okay, coach. Thanks. Let's do that. You know, let's be self play for the team. The team is bigger than me. You know, all that, that was the cool stuff I got to do. I didn't have to do one hitting drill with those kids they are so trained. You know, I didn't have to do any ground balls. Let's just show up to the game. That's what grabbed the girls when I coached them the last, you know, as a as yeah. a varsity coach, you know. That was very beautifully said, actually. You can use a coach. You don't even have to <laughs> you don't even have to footnote. You know, I, I already subconsciously say that. Like at Pioneer, I mean, my philosophy of coaching is I tell the girls, okay, I'm gonna kind of teach you guys how to be utility players because yeah. one, we're a small school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and two, uh, we need to know pretty much infield outfield. You need to know the ins and outs of every position because chances are I might need to put you there if somebody gets injured, if somebody doesn't show up, you know, vice versa. But I also kind of let them know that hey, when you go to the college level for travel ball or you know, high school, but they need a right fielder, guess what? You're probably gonna go play right field. Just get the nine best bats exactly. and figure out the defense later, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's what we always say. Coaches are looking for offense. You can yeah. teach a defensive position. Yeah. I, uh, I just never, I never understood why the college coaches don't talk to us. We're the ones that see these kids day in and day out. You could put on a smiley face on Saturday and Sunday and be yeah. done with it. Yeah. You know, you can hold down your inner bitch, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. A little bit on the weekends, but day in and day out for 10 weeks or however long we have them, there's no way. Um, because they have embedded in them that travel ball gets me the scholarship, travel gets to this, but you're forgetting too with the high school, you're a student athlete and colleges also look at grades. 
guess who's going to be writing your letters of rec because they're looking at people in the high school. They don't ask a letter of rec from your college coach no, or right. your college coach, sorry, from travel. your travel, travel. coach. Yeah. And so, you know, we need to find a way to work together. I, I was a college coach. I had to recruit and it was a little suspect to go and say, oh, you're just the uh, chemistry teacher and you're looking for a stipend. There were those coaches. And then there was people like maybe me and you guys where you actually played and you understand what it takes at that level. No, and I agree. Amanda and I went to a women's conference, a women's coaching conference two years ago now. Right, Amanda? Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the things the the college coaches were saying was they look for the whole package, right? Yeah. Your character, how you represent yourself on and off the field academically, because they don't want to chase you academically. Right. They don't want to worry about mm -hmm. you, things like that. And then of mm -hmm. course they said parents, parents in the stands. I mean, I mean, that's another one that's contributing with all of that too. And yeah. everyone wants that light. Everybody wants to be a part. I, I think we're, we're going to be in a great spot and I'm, I'm interested from the, the, a man's point of view. I had daughters, I have daughters and, and, you know, getting them involved in sports and those kind of things. And I, there was this big, there was this big discrepancy between um, the hardcore athletes and the girls that still wanted to look pretty. And, you know, were were more concerned with, with the, that, that balance of, I want to be a girl, but I want to be an athlete. And there was this constant conflict, they were both. it seemed like. You know, it just I didn't, I didn't talk like, about the bows yet. We're going to have to talk about well, it. It seemed like there was a conflict and I, I'm yeah. wondering whether there was a motivational thing for girls not being, not being um, given the same opportunities as boys. Is there a motivational thing that made you work harder and really made you committed or pissed you off or, you know, I can answer a woman in sport was the first time I actually had um, a confrontation with an umpire and as a coach <laughs> And I went to argue a call and the umpire gave me one of these, a no, no, no. I said, I just no. did it. I knew it. And then, yeah. See, and then a few plays later, the male coach on the other side had the same issue and got the time of day. How, how so, many times do you think anybody put their finger up in my face ever in oh, 30 years? Probably none. Yeah. I, I forgot this was an audio podcast. I did a hand signal. for all you guys. <laughs> Zero. There is nobody that says I can't come talk to you. I had male coaches growing up, but then in college and in high school, I had female coaches. So I never really felt a battle. I've always felt like I could do whatever I needed to do. I can compete. I can do this. We were all athletic and my parents are PE teachers. So that, that athletic mentality and that environment always existed for me. And it was that moment that I went, huh, there's the difference. Here's the yeah. point where you can drop a couple F-bombs if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? The first thing I do as a coach, when I know that there, it's a male um umpire, and I was taught this by my dad, is you always have a firm handshake. So they know I'm not scared. And so. <laughs> the big secret here is I know a lot of referees, and referees are all umpires. Softball is where umpires go to die. They're the worst of the worst. They're the umpires that could not hang in baseball, whatever that means. And I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like a jackass, but don't ever, but don't ever let those guys act like they're better than you because they are on their last leg. They're, they're the next stop, the park league, next stop, slow pitch yeah. softball, because. And you know that you brought up an interesting point too. Why is that? Why is softball the last leg of the umpiring? Why would you? You get you know? seven innings. It's fast. It's quick. It's bang, bang. You're in and out. I think it's the greatest game of all time. I would never coach baseball. Yeah. Baseball is boring. I mean, I don't mind watching it, but what? who would want to coach that? <laughs> <laughs> who would want to coach that? First, pickoff move. Pickoff move. Yeah, well, well that, that's a whole nother show. That's a whole nother show, Tom. We can we can argue. We can argue that part of it all, all we Jack want. Jack and his roommate are both baseball coaches. You know, I, I used to say... <laughs> I used to say baseball was five minutes of action crammed into three hours. You're out there coaching and you're, I don't care whether you're coaching girls or guys, you're, you're coaching a sport, you're competitive, you know, that, that you have to be put in that position is kind of what, what I'm talking about. You know, I, yeah. that would just drive me absolutely nuts. You know, that would, I mean that before you even get started, you're being looked at as being a second class citizen. How did you get past that? You know, did you have a role model that, that taught you, was, you know, were your parents telling you it doesn't matter whether you're a girl or a guy, you go and get what you want? I mean, who was that in your life, Patty, that, that was, were the role models that got you past that point? 
Well, I, of course, my parents are always, you know, role models. And But my brother was a big role model and um, like an inspiration. He's 10 years older than me. He's almost like a second dad. My brother and I would communicate a lot. That became something. And he was always very supportive and things. And um, one thing I always had with Di, Amanda said about having a strong handshake with the umps. I did that. I always had a rule book. Like someone had a quest. Oh, no, 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 no. Like it is right. Yeah. A rule book. But yeah, no, I think my brother was probably my my biggest inspiration there. And I had a, a female second grade teacher who I'm still friends with, who always said, like, whatever you want to be, you, you do it and you do it to the best of your ability and to have pride in what you do. Did you have somebody like that, Di, that, that stands out, coaches, or, or I know your parents were involved. Yeah, but... no, my parents are, are very involved and they're still involved to this day. Uh, so I, I've been very fortunate with that. But from a coaching perspective and, and seeing some of my coaches, um, Coach Bianca Ukiti at Rio Hondo, mm-hmm. um, and even Coach Jennifer Bridges at Whittier College, who's now the head coach at Sonoma State, nice. um, those two are just phenomenal females. And they were always tough and always pushed you and challenged you. And Coach B would always say, like, you could be better. That female role model or somebody who you have to kind of like follow in those footsteps um, as well. I have, a, I have a big question for you guys. It's something that's haunted me my whole career. I have a really, really, really hard time with umpires that when they ring somebody up, looking you know strike out looking and they do the dance and they do all this grandstanding yeah all this <laughs> you know the guy's this feeble old dude over here that hasn't said one thing and all of a sudden he's going to do a dance and and it bothers me it bothers me because that's probably the worst moment of that young lady's week for god's sake she doesn't want to strike out looking you don't have to you know everyone knows so i lose it on those guys i don't i have a tremendous amount of patience but i really make sure they hear me and i'll grandstand in front of the parents a little bit just like he did <laughs> So I do that if I get ejected from the game, or even if I don't, I get this tremendous loyalty from the girls, from my players. And I don't know if that's okay or not. I don't know if it's a cheap, a cheap loyalty that I just got because I was some knight in shining armor for some kid, like, you know, gen, uh, sexuality, gender, sexuality thing. Or do they really say, gosh, that's the first guy that ever stood up for me and I appreciate that. Or he reminds me of my pop or my grandfather and I, I respect that. You know, I don't want to be that guy. Oh, there's Mr. Football guy. You know, he probably puts drinks beer and puts his fist through the wall. I don't want that either. I'm, I'm the, I could be the one of the only male role models for those. Hey, wait a minute, man. I never Chuck. (laughs) Put your knuckles up on the screen. Is that, is that, is that coming to the rescue and taking right. away something that they have to should be working out themselves, I think is, is what my thought mm-hmm. is. Yeah, should they be confronting the umpire? What or should you, I be confronting about, the umpire? What do you think about that? About that. And I've been on the I had been on the end of being rung up, you know, like three strikes <laughs> looking and stuff. I think um too, you know, I, I had parents and, and fathers and brothers and everybody else that were supportive. So I don't know that I know that mindset. You know, if you were my coach and you did that for me, I think it would spark something of like hmm dang coach did that for me like I gotta like snap out of it I think it's 30 years of getting ejected (laughs) (laughs) you know what's funny is that my dad growing up um I mean he was definitely one of my role he'd probably be the number one person I pick as my role model um growing up yeah and in fact he still is my stats guy does the announcements Mm -hmm. for pioneer softball like tries to come out to the dugout and coach me on coaching still like <laughs> Di has to separate us at times when she was on the field with me <laughs> sometimes Patty's over there I'm like get my dad out of here um but anyways uh, he was the guy he was the guy that would get ejected out of the game because I mean sometimes I'm have to be like dad I always tell the umpires hey if the guy behind home plate gives you grief he's my dad just an advocate for so many of us growing up and I mean still to this day all of the girls that he coached just admire and respect him. I wish he didn't Mm. as an athlete. I appreciate that. Thank you. Athlete. Yeah. I wish he did not. And the reason for it is I remember, I remember the first game he got ejected because they made, you know, they make him go where you can't see him. And I'm like, where am I going to get home? Like, you know, I just didn't understand. I'm like eight years old, you know. Like, to the parking lot. Exactly. And it's like, you just got thrown out of a freaking Little League game. Like, or, yeah, you know. I wish, because growing up, I really, when I got to be in my high school years, I had to learn how to work through situations like that. The game got to me mentally a lot Mm. 
And softball and baseball are one of the hardest games to play because the percentages of yeah, being failure sport are very, mm-hmm. very low. And so I didn't understand that. And I was this four-year varsity player, star of Magnolia softball team, because I was good and I and my team wasn't that good. And so I stood out constantly. So I felt the need that I had to perform um, at A plus level all the time. And so when I did not, and I was, you know, rung up by an umpire like that, I mean, it hit deep and I had to really fight through those emotions because I would let it affect my game. And the batter gets called out at the plate and he stands, you know, the runner stands up and he starts yelling at the umpire and the, the umpire takes off his mask. And like within three seconds, Dave Roberts is in there taking the ejection. Like he's standing in for his boy. He's pushing his boy back. He's, he's talking. Da, 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 da. That's the scenario I want. I want the girl to go after the gentleman and then me come in and get her out of it. Absolutely. But the lady like the lady like this is do you have class are you lady like are you that's not the way we're supposed to that's not the way girls behave that's you're not being a young woman dichotomy drives me bananas i coach ball players i don't coach girls exactly you're coaching yeah. athletes but- that's what ball players do they have passion they mm-hmm. care that much and that's what i tell my principal i said no 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 she's not getting suspended you know she cared that much for this place and that jersey you know whatever but there, i was i was told at some point with two daughters stop saving them you know you need to let them they can't rely on you coming in and saving them because eventually their behavior gets a little worse because they know that you're going to come in and save them and i really that really made sense to me and again i didn't understand that until somebody pointed that out the young lady needs to know that you're there for her but she also needs to handle her business um i coached and trained girls i mentioned earlier and I found that girls, to me, were way tougher and way more responsive faster than the guys were. You know, oh, yeah. the guys would, you know, they run across the line in, in conditioning and then they hang their heads and they look sad and they go, oh, you coach. Girls turned around and, and Got they the were line. tired. If they were looked tired. But they, you know, and I had, I think I told this story earlier on. I had the girls come to me early on in the training sessions and I trained a girls softball team for about five months. They came to me, the captains came to me and said, you need to push us harder. <laughs> you, know, you don't, don't yeah. act, don't treat us like girls. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, and, and, and they responded without looking like it was punitive. You know, they really understood that our norm, our normal, our normal response time is, is a little slower than, than what you, you know, what you would expect. So you got to get on us. Yeah. You know, and it was really interesting. Are there different ways of of coaching women that you guys have realized over the years that that there are certain aspects of a, of a female athlete that you needed to tend to? I think females always have to prove a point, right? We're mm-hmm. we're yeah. groomed that way, and if we're athletic, I know you talked about it before of just our gender identity and you know the bows in our hair and the nice uniforms and the flashy. I think of a league of their own when they have to go to charm school. Oh my goodness. How dare that girl talk back to the umpire, but yet a a male athlete can do the same. And girls know that. And we, we see it and we learn it. So we have to be harder. We can't cry. We can't show that we're in pain. We're going to keep pushing through whatever it is. And then if we see the boys doing something, we want to do the same and, and challenge ourselves even more because we're always having to prove ourselves. The number one thing we, we fight with is teen pregnancy. As we say, girls miss nine months, boys get to play tomorrow. And having those conversations and going back to that male coach, female coach, right? Yeah. I'm not sure how male coaches handle that type of conversation with a female do athlete, you, or how do you have, have those conversations? Yeah. Do you do you really talk about those things? Yes. Where as us as, female, <laughs> yeah, as as female coaches, right? I mean, that's Amanda's number one rule. I'm sorry, you can't have a boyfriend during season. These are Amanda, all. Amanda, wow. I don't. Yeah. I'm serious. It's yeah. prom season. What about prom? Right. Yeah, no. You better hope it's in May and season's over. <laughs> um, my first year at Pioneer, my star player got pregnant, and I don't. I don't know, because I've never really coached a male sport to compare the two. And I don't know if those are the conversations right. that they have or it's it's definitely a, a different kind of experience. You know, like when I first started coaching, sexuality was a huge issue. It was a very a much different looking sport. There were different types of athletes that were playing more 
uh, butchy. That was a huge thing. And, and the girls who were sort of more feminine or whatever struggled very, very much with that whole sexuality thing. You know, they, number one, I tell Chuck, they were way tougher than their boyfriend. So their boyfriend could be the star quarterback and he's a big sissy compared to my shortstop. You know, my shortstop is badass. Like, I know she's going to be ready for motherhood. I know she's going to be ready for corporate America. She's badass. Mm. That's what we coach. We coach badasses. That's it. But, you know, that I would also see my star shortstop, you know, stand in the shadow of her boyfriend, who is the star quarterback, you know, and I'm like, nah. You know, right. those are things that, that you have to, you know, you have to think about and you have to mm. be able to address, you know, and, and have yeah. those conversations that, you you know, we have conversations with the guys about getting their girlfriends pregnant and those kind yeah. of things and their, and their, you know, their, their respect for the females, you know, and that's such a, a big part of what I learned over the course of years. You're either a transactional coach, like, mm. what are you going to do for me when you do for me, I will do for you. And that's how our relationship will be. And then we became we learned and, and grew up a little bit and matured a little bit and heard people talk about being a transformational coach. Right. Like my job was more than just winning. It was transforming these young men into, you know, good people, good men, productive members of society, people who treated women with respect. I was just coming into this world of enlightenment with all this stuff. And I said to them, you're, you have one job and that's to love each other. And I said, and I have one job and that's to love you. And I swear to God, I thought they were going to try and get me fired right then and there. You know, they looked at me <laughs> like, who in the hell are you? And what are you, where did you put our football coach? Because this is just, this is bullshit. Once they figured out that loving you, I mean, I'm going to kick you in the ass and be consistent and stay on you. And I'm going to care yeah. about all those things. Then I was just like, you know, I was just like a regular coach. But, you know, in those terms, I mean, there's a lot of things about the, the a young lady growing up that yeah, I, I would imagine you have to address like that. My argument is if you can argue with an umpire and not and have the self-control to get your point across and not get kicked out of the game before your coach comes and gets kicked out of the game, then you can say no to your boyfriend from time to time. <laughs> like, that's the thing, right? If you can say it to me, I tell them that all the time. I say, if you come and negotiate with me, if you can negotiate with me, I'm going to give you a look and I'm going to like give you body language. And if you can hang with me, you can hang with anybody in corporate America. You can hang with your boyfriend. You can talk to your dad. You can talk yeah. to your, your your priest, whatever, you know, whatever you have to do. This idea that these women are afraid to talk to people, we're afraid to say no and all that. Oh, it drives me bananas. You know, like, no, 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 no. That's the most powerful thing. And not, not just with sex, but like, you know, like, no, I'm not going to do this. I need to take care of myself. I need to get, I have my season. I, I just, you're empowering them, right? Empowering yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like when the girls tell me stuff. I do. Yeah. Chuck and I and talk about it all the time. If you curse at me or you can, you call me out on my drill, you may or may not be right, but at least you're doing it. I'm not going to ever respond back. If, if you're in a good relationship, they're going to support your same goals. They're going to sit and watch your games. They're going to support that you need to go to practice, not hold you back from them. Um, and I think that's what's so much more to coaching is, you know, the the whole person, right? Yeah. It's not just fundamentals. And, you know, in our state at Pioneer, it's it's everything, right? It is the fundamentals, the basics, and then teaching life and and how to respect yourself. And again, like Willie said, to to love yourself, because even that is you get some of those kids that either have drill sergeant parents and just, no, you need to be perfect. You need to be batting 500. You need to do this. You need to do that. Right. They, they don't have that love for the game. Right. It's that. Yeah. And then you have some that don't have any family support and you are the only support. Mm -hmm. right. And how do we make that everywhere on top of empowering women and doing this? And it just becomes just one thing after another, after another. And where do we grow from that? Like who teaches you that? How do you become a coach? Oh, you know what? I played a couple of years. Here I go. Here I am. Here I'm a coach. I think going to that conference for the first time with Amanda out of my seven years coaching, that was the first time I ever even thought to do something like that. Right. Do we continue to have these open conversations? I think what you guys are doing is great and starting these conversations because it's getting people together and it's getting people to really talk about these things that we don't. You know, I was at St. Paul for a long time and we had success that was part of just a momentum. And I thought we were in a different spot. I, you know, my wife is, she makes more money than me. She's stronger than me. She's tougher than me. She's punk rock all the way. <laughs> I'm cool. You know, I'm like right on. And then Megan Rapino stands up after hitting a goal and goes like this triumphant in the biggest stage in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, she's going to go on to be the MVP of that tournament. And she got, 
I, and I was like in tears on my couch until the next day when I went to work and people that were really talking shit. There's not one thing about that that I thought was bad. Like I, I couldn't even extrapolate something that could be wrong with that in my mind, other than, oh, she's an out person. She's a lesbian person. She's arrogant. Okay, fine. Every Sunday you see arrogant people. Are you, what are you kidding that's, me? That's clearly a double standard. I mean, you guys still seeing, you guys still see the double standard in, in that, you know, the, is that still? I want to meet her, Chuck. I don't want to freaking talk shit about her. I want to meet, I want to, what, what makes you tick? That's, that's but you're, badass. But you're a much more highly evolved individual. Oh, you know, I'm talking mm -hmm. about that frontal lobe, Chuck. Regular, regular, regular <laughs> average guy, you know. <laughs> what, are, what are your coaching philosophies and what are your best practices, things that you have learned along the way that really have made a difference to you? And uh, All right, Socrates, let's go. <laughs> the, no, the no boyfriend? Gosh, now that I'm putting on the spot, I'm like, dang, what is my philosophy? You know? <laughs> my go-to is that I just have such a, a great love and passion for the game of softball and for uh, female athletes. I'm very, very big on uh, team bonding. I think that a team could have all the talent in the world, but if they don't have a good vibe and a positive vibe and that like sisterhood connection, they're not going to perform well, really teaching them, um, how to love the game, how to love one another, how to, uh, love the, I, or welcome the idea of being coachable and just trying to always evolve. I can remember the scores of your game. Okay. What you're going to remember, though, is is certain moments that you just feel like, you know, that stuck out to you, like either if it's a memory with a teammate or maybe you had a great play or maybe, you, you know, those are what you're going to remember. And so there's so many life lessons that are pulled off of the field that are just factored into your later life. That the whole takeaway, as, as Amanda was saying, right, that's what you want to instill. And I, I'm going off of the same thing of Amanda of like play for the love of the game and opportunities will follow. And you get those thanks from your athletes that you've pushed them through something, you helped them, you guided them. Either. That's what you're coaching for. Absolutely. I want to be remembered as giving back. I want to be remembered as I helped you through something. I've helped you grow, empowered you somehow. Like those are what matter. You can have the team already. Didn't really coach them anything because they were all set and, and you're just watching or you're collecting that paycheck. Like, no, that's not what it's all about. For Patty, I know, I know I'm going to, I'm going to set this up for you, Patty, if you don't mind, but I know Patty, one of Patty's um, sports I'll, can I say heroes or is Oral Hershiser the bulldog? Oh, her man. Oh, yeah, right. And and I know that's true. And he was his 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 go to or, or what he was known for it was he was such a fierce competitor. You know, is that is that kind of is that play into your philosophies and and oh, wow. your coaching? There was something about him that I loved. Uh, I read his book like early on. He got cut from his high school team, and you know, I think I I felt that way. You know, like. Guy and Amanda played since they were seven and eight years old competitively. And I started at, you know, 14 kind of. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there was just something about him when I watched him and how he, um, he dug deep, right? And um, he put on a whole nother face. High school, I was like 100 pounds and playing and catching. And I played in, in LA City where we were playing Carson and Banning that had these great Samoan San Pedro. Yeah, San Pedro. Yeah, I, I, I knew I had to like dig deep and there was something about him that I felt like he didn't have that, um, the acknowledgements, right? And just a like crazy backstory, lots of years of writing to him and I finally got to meet him. So um, there's there's a weird friendship too. Like he's, I have him in my phone, right? Like, uh, uh, so so awesome. it, cool. I've developed a friendship with him and um, he knows that I, I think that was one of the things that I used to try to instill in our teams is dedication, right? And and that it was we were a family, and you and might no captains. We had Ooh, no captains. No captains. We, had, like we were knights of the round table because if like you were on the varsity team, you should all be able to speak to each other, and help each other. Yeah, that's very cool. So knights of the round table. Die mm -hmm. was a travel ball girl, and I loved going and watching her and her sister play too mm -hmm. on the off seasons and. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from Dai and the girls that played travel ball. They came out with 
different, um, different workouts, different drills. When I was coaching, I took under consideration some of the things that they brought from other coaches. Um, if they had something that they, you know, Hey coach, can we try this? Well, tell me what it is. Let's try it. And if right. it worked out, you know, we embedded it into our, our work. So you have no idea. Pat. Did I you heard hear part of it? I didn't see it. Yeah. All. <laughs> you said the same, and I never heard it before in 30 years of coaching. She goes, yeah, I just give them a choice. Do they want to catch ground balls? They want to catch fly balls. It's your choice. And I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, Excuse me? Oh, give them a choice. <laughs> Empower them. Tom, oh, you yeah. never do that. Let them feel like they have a, a you know, a, a say in what they were doing. And one of the things that I had tremendous success with philosophy wise was that the girls needed to treat each other good. I tell them it's my job to criticize. It's your job to support your sisters. You have to practice helping each other out. Your default move is Coach is going to say something that's a little harsh. It's going to sting and I'm going to rub it because I'm your sister. That's a very powerful thing because I can push it now an extra 10% or an extra 20%. I could be a little harsh because I know the girls are going to pick each other up and that's going to, that's going to matter. No, I was just going to say, I, I think that's why I, I kind of love that I focus on the team Bonnie aspect is because I am always the bad cop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right, right. About, you know, 85% of the time, the other 15% of the time I spend, you know, loving that, loving them and having snacks from my classroom and, you know, doing yeah. all the other <laughs> extra stuff, but the yeah. 85% of the time, you know, the girls yeah. joke like, Hey, did coach make you cry this season? And not oh, that yeah. I, I like to make them cry, but it's, you know, I, I coach hard. Like I, I'm not going to go soft on you. You are, you know, you're a strong, independent woman and let's do this. You know, like you would be cheating them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're stealing from them if you do that. And and yeah, absolutely. And so that's a great point that you made. Like it is true. Like even if I let me do the criticism, I'm the one. Yeah. And so if we don't have that trust, that that closeness, then what kind of program are you building for yourselves? And and that's what you do in life, right? Your coworkers, your colleagues, your your people you're with. Like that's a life skill. Can't we just learn everything we need to learn just from winning? Like, isn't that a good enough tonic? You know, oh. isn't that a, you know, but not really. And you know, me and Chuck have this conversation. It's very deep. No, yeah. man, you got to teach him about life. You got to teach him about when the baby's crying at night. You got to get up. You got to go to work. You got to freaking pay the bill. And it, I'm like, no, nah, I just want to win. Well, you're you're play like champions, right? I, yeah, I mean, no. I, I think that is so key because it's yes, you, we should all be playing like champions. There's a certain, there's a certain aspect of, of that whole concept of, of, you know, you, you, you coach them to be champions and, and they develop championship behavior and, and, you right. know, and yes. whether or not you win everything or you make mm -hmm. it to the CIF championship or not, you're developing those championship characteristics in a, in a, in a person, a young person who's moldable still. And, you know, competitive. And I think that's, that's the deal. That's what I love about mm -hmm. coaches in general, be it girl coaches, guy coaches, the ones that I respect the most, you know, 90% of those guys are ego. You know, the, the most important thing is sitting in the bar, drinking beer and talking, telling stories. They're not there to learn anything. They're loud. They're obnoxious. And we used to think that we were, we were better than that. You know, I think that it was somewhat arrogant to a certain degree, but it was true because there were certain things that it was not about me. You know, and I don't need to be the smartest one in the room. That's why when you said, you know, I take a little bit from somebody else, oh. we steal everything. You know, it's nothing's yeah. original in coaching. You steal from everybody and you learn the right. things that are mm -hmm. your best practices. Patty and Di, I was so fortunate as, you know, it was my first head coach position at Pioneer. I've coached previously, was over at Loera as an assistant. It was a crazy transition because Loera won the league title like the last three years. Um, you know, under D4. And I came over to Pioneer. I actually had to coach. You kind of said that, Tommy, a little bit. About, like, All right, the cops, you know what I, mean? and I actually had to coach. And it was just such yeah. a different demographic that Di could have easily just said, peace, like, here's your program and walked away. <laughs> Good she, luck. Not only did they welcome me with open arms, but, you know, they knew that I was a former female athlete and just kind of, you, they, they wanted to guide me. They wanted me to be successful. They wanted to build me up. And it's just that kind of, um, I guess, environment I'm so fortunate for. And they're like my mentors. I was like, Oh, you know, it's so funny right now. I would typically be walking out to the PE field just to go chat it up with Di and Patty about <laughs> yeah. frustration about a game or, Hey, what do you think about putting this player at this mm -hmm. position? And, you know, like, and they go to my, they go to the games, they still support. I always jokingly say that they, I mean, they have an open invitation to come to any practice to mm -hmm. hit fly balls. Patty's mm -hmm. come out to do a bunting 
um, clinic, if you will. And <laughs> it, it, yeah. when I was pregnant, Di ran the program for me. Like Patty came out and assisted as well. Um, my generation, yeah. my generation of, of human beings was of women were very, very good at destroying other women. Yeah. It was, it was like normal. That bitch, that cattiness, that fuck her. That's my man. Screw that. I, I, I got to take her down so that I could be somebody. Be that can't be the way. When I watch the women's soccer team, those people seem to be having each other's backs. Yeah. They will stand together and they will do whatever they need to do. And the only reason I keep saying that they're the most high profile, but you get nothing from beating somebody down is all I'm trying to say. You don't, you don't gain anything. Well, I saw a quote uh, the other day. I have it. It says, girls compete with each other. Women empower one another. Pioneer. We're, we're kind of looked at like the redheaded stepchild, right? Or, or you know, I, I don't yeah. know say some of the things that I've heard. I that. But, um, we're the black sheep. The ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, but, you, but you want to support each other. And mm -hmm. no matter whether it's girl sports or boys sports, you got to take care of each other and be supportive and cheer for the boys teams and have the boys cheer for the girls teams and, and be there for each other as coaches. And I think once there's still a love for it and it was my first, you know, my first sport, I want to see it get better. And I want to see them um, do well. And You know, one of the things that I've learned – from these ladies and it was it was a tough transition um you know they 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 loved their coach and and he was you know a, I, I i just say this publicly is, is is one of the most um stand up guys on the planet is is your brother you know i mean he is he is ramon ramon is, has been through all the, the beginning all the way through he has checked his ego at the door on this deal and 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 has supported in some way or fashion and and or just stayed out of the way long enough to let me you know get my thing going but but you, the support that you guys gave me eventually and we all went through our ups and downs i mean it was it was a wild time in the beginning and i get it you know and you know, I can remember going and talking to a couple of you and going, Hey, you know, what are we doing here? You know, what's going on? <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and the, but the <laughs> ultimate support in the end was, was something that people talk to me all the time. Why do you keep staying there? I know it's a tough job. I know it's a different place. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, you know, you've been offered jobs at modern day. You've been offered jobs at St. John Bosco. You can go back to St. Paul. And I was, I, I was so enamored by the fact that the kids, those kids needed what I thought I could bring more than anybody else. Yeah, I know you guys. My, my mom and dad love you. They love you. <laughs> my mom and dad love you. They love well, to support and, and, you. you know, Do they yeah, subscribe yeah. to the podcast, Diane? Do they subscribe to the podcast? That's what <laughs> no. I want to know. You know they will now that I'm in They will. Well, Tom, and, and you got to understand, Tom. Yeah. Um, Diane's mom and dad, um, uh, Anthony, their son, my brother, and, yeah, and her brother, um, graduated after my first year. You know? Oh, okay. And, yeah. And, and my and, brother and I are and, 10 years apart. So I, he, he played he, under coach. Yeah. Dai's mom and dad stayed on as my booster club president and, and treasurer mm. for my whole run. You know, wow. their kid had graduated. And, and, and I mean, that was the kind of environment that we, we, we enjoyed. And, yeah. and it was such a, the point being is, is that I know you all are, are, are stand up people and, and quality coaches. And, and I really, have been excited waiting, you know, to get you guys on to talk about this stuff. And it can go, we can talk on and on forever and ever about it because it's a great Lord. conversation. Make sure you understand this is I, I love you all. And you guys are, are amazing people. And, and I'm glad that we're talking about this. Do we see a light at the end of the tunnel? I, I definitely hope so. Um, it, the, the goal is always the number one is, is safety and, and how can we get our athletes to be safe? Um, and it's getting that understanding to everyone to, we need to work together and that patience needs to be there. And that day will come where we are going to be back into athletics in a full swing. It's unfortunate. Our students now are missing these opportunities. I, I really feel for these seniors of class of 2021 has earned our, our respect and full thanks for their patience and understanding. It's a constant change. I, I mean, it's day to day, new information. Amanda has been doing a really nice job. We just started back at practice with conditioning you love the game, you're going to find ways to make it work yeah. in your own home. You're going mm -hmm. to exercise, run, work out, um, still keep nutrition, health, food, what you're eating. And of course, some sports you need somebody to catch with and do things, but there are still other drills that you can be doing to get better. It's not just a pause. 
right? And I think that's what happened with a lot of our student athletes is they felt like, okay, I'm just going to stop. And if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I was gonna. This is the first week back um, that we've get, been given the green right, light like four for months, conditioning. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was. I, I will say this. Um, I was running a virtual program. Like it's been insane yeah. throughout summer, throughout now, and in my head, I was like, "Yeah, right. These girls are like." they're not going to do it. Like, I know I was like to be in high school. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'd be probably eating chips on a couch too. Maybe doing a couple of runs here and there, you know, check, check but, some fingernails for the uh, Cheetos. Yeah, right? Like, but I will say this, they earned my respect this year. My girls, nice. not only is my team average GPA pretty high, I think it's like a four point something. Um, their grades are substantial. And that's another thing. I've had the time to write them every two weeks about their grades. They were actually in shape when they came out to the field. They were nice. actually in shape. And I was just like, you know what? Kudos to you guys. We have a lot of new faces. And I was mm. concerned about the team bonding aspect. You know, it was all about that. And I wasn't going to do conditioning four days a week. I was going to do mobility and core. And I had all these <laughs> other different plans, you know. But Pilates. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> Whatever I could do. You know, so much of what we do, we do like in person and, and making those posters for teams and, and right. bring them on and, and doing all this and that. And it's, it's hard um, because every, anytime we ask, you know, hey, do you need us to, to help support with, you know, top 100 is coming up and nah, nothing. Um, so we've gotten lists of names of seniors and I'm trying to get um, connected with those athletes. <clears throat> excuse me, and get pictures of them and try to try to give them that senior game type uh, feeling. So the hope is to come back. So. Yeah. Wow. And, and I think like yeah. you said, with with the COVID struggle is, you know, we, we can't guarantee a return date. I, I have this conversation all the time with uh, everybody of that disadvantage that we're in. And you're seeing that the disadvantage and that we want to say that everything is equal and everybody is fair. But, you know, when I'm at a park and I'm seeing this high school team <laughs> practicing, but not practicing, you know, and those quotes right there, you're at a disadvantage. And how do you oh. explain that to parents? And how do you explain that to others of why are they doing it? And we can't, and it's out of your control. And, and COVID has really shined that light of, mm. of the inequality in that way right of yeah and that's mm -hmm. all sports not even just females i mean for for our males yeah. too missing out on those opportunities i, th I think COVID has definitely um, has challenged some people and some open some eyes and questions on hey you can do it i can't and uh, there's, yeah. there's no well, what's answer the sense in, what's the sense in having any rules if if there are certain people that aren't going to follow them and then there's Correct. no consequences mm -hmm. you know right. it's kind of exactly. it's kind of it's kind of akin to our political situation yeah i was gonna I say that's congress we tell about you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things going on that are inconsistent, and and it's mm -hmm. you know, that's why I say I hope that we can get back together soon so that the the day to day routines come back and their the interactions Absolutely. come back. And I can't wait though. I can't wait, Chuck, for that first like round of sprints or whatever where they're oh. bitching, they're bitching about sprints. I'm like, well, you could be at home doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Like, I've never seen my girls more excited yeah. about conditioning in my That's life. Cool. And Tommy, I right. think you you hit it on the nose. Now is the time to make those changes. If your program was a struggling program, or yeah. If, yeah. if you were ever going to restart, it's now. And remind them of, hey, enjoy every day you're out here because we say it all the time, like play like it's your last. And ironically, it showed up yeah. last year. Play like March it's 13th. your last um, is enjoy that moment and don't gripe about the sprint, run another one, run it faster, you know? And I, I think we, we have to stay with that positive mindset. And, and that's what I think you're doing with your podcast and kind of moving forward and, and doing all that stuff. And I think it's great. And those are the mindsets we need to start setting. If you guys could turn back the clock, this would be my last question. If you can turn back the clock, knowing what you know now, what, how would you want to be coached? How do you want to be coached? What did you need? Hey, that wasn't one of the questions. I know, I know. I just, I just thought of that one. <laughs> That's my specialty. Sorry. Oh, I think about that one all the time. I, I totally wished I, I had a better someone with a nutritional mindset. Um, oh, I, nice. I think that that value is so important, right? I understood the game. I understood sprinting. I, you know, we were, we were in levels for running, and I was like level three for a shortstop, and I was slow. <laughs> but I said I'd beat you around the bases. Right. Because I understood touching corners. Right, I can right. beat the fastest girl. 
comprehended at, at how those two go in hand, right? Yeah. Staying healthy and staying fit at the same time. If you didn't want to run track, you didn't want to run around in soccer, you know, you weren't in shape, you couldn't play softball. You know, that was the place for you. You didn't have to run. They didn't want to be in PE, so they wanted to play a sport. So they come on out. I was like, did you ever play this softball before? No. Do you know how to? No. I'm like, this is a skill game. I don't know what you think this is. It's oh, yeah. casual. Beyond. We're all eating sunflower seeds. I mean, I get it, but Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> The gym is headed by Jeff Etherson, who used to play football with my husband. Oh, and wow. we always, all of us, you know, athletes growing up in the 2000s, early 2000s, we've always said, why didn't it, why, <laughs> we never really had this training and okay. like nutritional mm-hmm. mindset yeah. as athletes. I mean, I'm talking about, I would buy like a $2 pizza and that would be my <laughs> lunch before a game. Oh, yeah. Now <laughs> I'm like, I have the girls in my room at game day because uh-huh. I want to see that they're one eating. And that's no, another concept. But you but get the I pizza know. and you rub it in your glove and it oils the glove <laughs> I up. I guess, like, <laughs> man. It softens it up. Um, I think too, another thing that I wish I would have had was, you know, I grew up in a, a, a fairly rough neighborhood where uh, we were a smaller school, um, a lot of gang affiliation in that neighborhood um, to want to expand my horizons outside Mm. of that area. You know, it wasn't, and I remember just being so bummed out that I wasn't able to play travel ball because of financial reasons. And I wish I had somebody, you know, when we went to the women's conference, I asked about that because that's the inequality that exists at Pioneer. A lot of them can't afford it. And a lot of the co- college coaches said, you know, you can ask for sponsors or just, I wish I had somebody there to show me that the different routes I could have taken in order to still mm-hmm. achieve my goal. You know, I, I'm first gen, gen gra- college graduate too. My parents, my parents didn't push, you know, they didn't care. They were just, you know, they, they cared about, my dad cared about softball. My mom was more like academics, academics and academic scholarship. Okay, no, don't worry about softball really teach me how to warm up well you know like back in the day you're just doing some jumping jacks and doing some stretches and you didn't like jog (laughs) cherry pickers in there (laughs) yeah you know um like really kind of teach me how to do that yeah (laughs) arm circle (laughs) pen (laughs) And, and when I got to Whittier we still didn't have a strength um and conditioning coach until probably my senior year Kenton, my husband, is a was formerly a strength and conditioning coach, and he worked in the minor leagues with baseball. And just even talking to him about things to strengthen my shoulder, even now, you know. Did you, did you have injuries? Is that what this part of this is oh, about? Oh, yeah, yeah. I had, like, very bad bicepital tendonitis, and I wow. became a first baseman at some point because um, I couldn't throw anymore. Throwing. I'm sure it was from not really warming up well or um, things like that. And playing through the pain, you know, like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to play. And my, my brother was my college coach. I, I decided to go to Whittier before he got the job. So that's oh, wow. a whole nother story <laughs> that like, I didn't start my freshman year. So when I did get like a start and I was injured, I wasn't going to tell him cause I wanted to play. Right. Nice. And then when mm-hmm. I I was like three errors as a freshman at base. He like yanked me out really fast. It's just great information. It's great for guys to listen to. It's great for girls to listen to. And I think it's a great conversation for us to continue to have. Uh, um, all right. I'm going to call on you like a teacher. So <laughs> you're first. One person who made an impact on your life that doesn't know it. Di. Di has made what? an impact <laughs> on my life. Um, I was thinking about this one and I don't know that she knows it, but she has... She was my student, my athlete. She's my friend. And um, she has taught me so much about teaching, coaching, helps me with IT. And um, that's rad. <laughs> she's very much an inspiration. And I thank her for everything that she does for me. We ask these questions every single podcast. And I always say to the person, God, I guess you're going to have to make a phone call tonight. You know, because everyone says the same thing like these bitching, they have these great things about these people. I'm like, well, you need to call them and tell them. And here you are, right in the middle of a podcast. Make it you easy. Oh, thank you, Patty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Diana, um, things every young athlete should know, or a thing. Oh, gosh, thing every athlete should know. You know, I, I think they should know is there's more to the sport than what is what is just presented, yeah. right? There's always something more to um 
learn from it, gain from it. It's not just playing by the rules and, and doing mm. all this thing. And it's going to shape who you are as a person. Yeah. You're playing for love of the game, but also for the benefits of who you are in character. Yeah. And, and that's what, that's what I would think every young athlete should understand. All right, Amanda, are you ready? Yep. If you had Bezos money, what would you spend it on to make your country or your community stronger? Oh, gosh. I would probably sponsor all my girls to be part of a <laughs> legit travel ball team. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the times they're just missing little bits and pieces to the overall perfect mm-hmm. athlete. It could be commitment. It could be the resources to play, you know, on a on a credible travel ball team. It could be missing a dad. It could so what we're going to do now is we're going to do our short list of speed round where we're going to just do an either or you just pick. So we're going to go Amanda. You're going to say the answer. And then Diane, you're going to say the answer. And, and then Patty. OK, so it's very easy. Just the first thing that pops in your head. I'm a psychology teacher. So are you ready? <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Elvis or Jerry Lee? Elvis. 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 Okay. Beatles or Stones? Beatles. Beatles. Stones. Hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Whitney or Shania? Whitney. Whitney. You're talking about Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston or Shania Twain? Whitney. Yeah, yeah good call. Target or Walmart? Target. 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 Okay. Coke or Pepsi? That was my question of the day. Uh, Pepsi. <laughs> Neither. I drink water. (laughs) Don't tell my wife. (laughs) Pepsi. Beer or booze? Mm, Beer. Mixed drinks. (laughs) Hard liquor. (laughs) Hard liquor. We coach hard liquor. Um, Android or iOS? Uh, Is that iOS iPhone, right? Yeah. iPhone. Okay. This is might be an easy one. Softball or soccer? <laughs> Softball. <laughs> Softball. Softball. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> All right. Uh, beard or clean shaven? Oh, gosh. Uh, you all have husbands, right? So, no. I, <laughs> no, I not not beard and I'm Oh, like, die. you're not there. Okay. Yeah, right now. <laughs> uh, halfway goatee. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be worse than Amanda. I'm like, depends on the face. Somewhere appeared well. Some Got to cover some stuff shaven. up, buddy. It just depends. Depends on the face. Uh, what about you? Usually, usually clean shaven. Okay. No Duck <laughs> Dynasty thing going on? No. Uh, <laughs> little beard is okay. A good beard is fine. But yeah, no yeah, Duck yeah. Dynasty. Yeah. Friday. Um, <laughs> all right. All right, Amanda. Brad Pitt or George Clooney? Brad Pitt. Oh, I'm a Brad Pitt girl. George Clooney. Good. <laughs> uh, Catwoman or Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman. Catwoman. Linda Evans. Wonder Woman. Uh, <laughs> uh, beach or mountains? Mountains. Mountains. Beach. Vanilla or chocolate? It's our last one. Vanilla. Chocolate. Vanilla. All right. That is it. (laughs) That is it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, ladies. I appreciate it so much. We're, uh, we're, uh, I, but I appreciate you coming on. It was fantastic to hang out with you. And no, see you thank guys you again. for having us. Yeah, thanks so for having much us. fun. Oh this my is gosh. too cool. Too cool this for is sure. Great. Yeah. Well, this it's, is the first. This is the first group we've had on together, and it, and, it, and it's awesome that it's you guys. And uh, I, like I said, I, I miss seeing you, and I can't wait to get back and uh, and see you. Although it's really like practicing to be. Uh, I'm down to one day a week, and and it's like <laughs> practicing to be retired. So <laughs> <laughs> you got time to do podcasts and editing. It's great. Oh, so, that's well, good. All right. We'll love you guys and uh, and we'll see you soon. All right, you guys. I'll take care. Love and, you too. Uh, nice meeting you. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Subscribe on YouTube. Even your dog <laughs> needs to subscribe, please. <laughs> Got it. Thanks, right. everybody. Bye. Bye. Send Bye. my love to your families. All right. Take care.